I'm Randy Papadopoulos. I'm the Secretariat Historian for the Department of the Navy. And it is my privilege and pleasure to introduce a good friend uh, to you today who will be our speaker. Uh, Dr. John Darrell Sherwood is a, a, was trained at the at Columbia University, where he received his Bachelor's and Master's of Arts in History, and then at the George Washington University, where he received his PhD, which is where I met John before there were four Star Wars movies, never mind seven Star Wars movies. That tells you how long I've known John. He is the author of Officers in Flight Suits, the, his the story of American Air Force fighter pilots in the Korean War, which made the Chief of Staff of the Air Force's reading list back in the 1990s. Also the author of Fast Movers, Jet Pilots, and the Vietnam Experience. And then for the Naval History and Heritage Command, his current employer, he has written Afterburner, Naval Aviators in the Vietnam War, Black Sailor, White Navy, Racial Unrest in the Fleet during the Vietnam War Era, Nixon's Trident, Naval Power in Southeast Asia, 1968 to 1972, and today's title, War in the Shallows, U.S. Navy Coastal and Riverine Warfare in Vietnam, 1965 to 1968. The book is available for purchase from Government Printing Office. We don't have any copies to pass out today. But Dr. Sherwood also has a copy of a business card which has the URL, so you can actually get download a free copy in PDF format um, from the web. But without further ado, John Sherwood, please come up. Thank you, Randy. And I'd like to thank the OSD History Office for putting on this series. Uh, it's a very good series. and. Um, I'm proud to be a part of it. Today I'm going to be discussing my new book, War in the Shallows, U.S. Navy Coastal and Riverine Warfare in Vietnam. And I'm going to start out by showing some slides of individual sailors. And some of them are, are familiar to many. This is uh, BM1 James Elliott Williams. The Navy currently has a DDG named after him, and a Burt class. Uh, he's a Medal of Honor recipient. But here are some folks who are less familiar. This is uh, BM3 Joseph VR Camara uh, and, and GM3, GM3 Paul Cagle. And I show you these pictures because I want people to know that the emphasis on the book is not only operations. The, the book covers major operations of the three inshore task forces in Vietnam. But there's also a focus on individual sailors and officers and their stories. These officers and enlisted personnel dominate the story. And, and why is that? It's because in the Vietnam War, lower ranking, lower ranking sailors and officers played a larger role in combat decision making than, ev than, than ever before in naval history. This was, a, this was a war in which small boats were commanded either by junior officers, in many cases ensigns or, or JGs, lieutenants, or as the war expanded, uh, chief petty officers became boat commanders. And then as the war expanded more, we even had first class petty officers and in some cases second class petty officers. So this was a this was a sea change from sort of the Cold War Navy, the Blue Water Navy, where you know, major combat decision making rested with the destroyer squadron, the carrier, uh, the cruiser. So ordinary sailors in Vietnam possess what I call agency. And by agency, I mean the capacity to make decisions in war, use of force, decision-making authority. Junior officers were the key to operational success in many instances. This is a picture of Lieutenant Steve El Ulmer, U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, Steve Ulmer was here last week. If any of you attended SNA, he participated in the Heritage uh, panel session with me. He was involved in a trawler intercept uh, in involving Point League. There were 12 major trawler intercepts, uh, and he was, uh, he was a skipper of one. The in-country naval war. War in the Shallows covers essentially three aspects, or three major task forces in the war. 
TF-115, which was market time. It was a coastal surveillance task force. Uh, TF-116, which was game warden, which was the river patrol force. TF-117, the mobile riverine force, which was a combined Army-Navy unit. The Army component was the 9th Infantry Division. The Navy component was TF-1117. It was used for amphibious assaults. And the book ends at, with the Tet Offensive. And why does the book end at the Tet Offensive? Well, the book ends with Tet because after Tet, Admiral Zumwalt came on board. He became the, the, command, the overall commander for, for the in-country naval war, ComNav for V. And he shifted the strategy. He kluged elements of the three major task forces together, pushed those elements up the rivers towards Cambodia, uh, in, and form blocking belts in an operation called Sea Lords. Uh, this book covers everything that happened before then, including the role of TF-115 and 116 during the Tet Offensive, which, according to Westmoreland, and some historians dispute whether Westmoreland said this or not, but, but Westmoreland uh, I've seen at least one document that states that Westmoreland did say that the MRF, and by MRF he meant Navy and Army, saved the Mekong Delta during the Tet Offensive. What does the book not cover? The book does not cover carrier operations. There was a whole other war, and that's the war that took place off of Yankee Station, and it involved aircraft carriers uh, conducting bombardment against the North, and there were ma major bombing campaigns, Rolling Thunder, uh, line, Linebacker, and there was also naval gunfire support both along the coast of South Vietnam and North Vietnam. I only talk about naval gunfire insofar as it applies to TF-115. Um, I don't talk about logistics. I talk about logistics when it, when it relates to riverine coastal, but I don't, I don't talk about the bridges and road building efforts of the Seabees, and that was a, a, a tremendous effort. Uh, I also don't talk about naval support activities. And people don't realize this, but more sailors served in NSAs, and by NSA I don't mean na uh, National Security Agency, but I mean naval support activity, uh, than any other element in, in country. That was the law that the NSA Saigon and Da Nang absorbed more sailors than any other unit in country. Uh, I don't talk about naval medicine. Uh, the Navy has a very fine office, Bureau of Na Naval Medicine History Office, that has published some very fine works on that topic. I don't cover the Sea Lords period. And if there are any, if anyone is in graduate school or thinking about a dissertation, Sea Lords would be an excellent period to focus on. Uh, finally, I don't cover Vietnamization, and I don't cover frequent wind uh, and eagle pull, pull, the evacuation of Saigon and, and Phnom Penh. The focus of this book is on brown water and green water operations. I don't use the term littoral combat because that didn't exist in Vietnam, and that would be sort of writing history backwards. Uh, instead, I use brown and green water, and even the term green water was not, not widely used in Vietnam. Uh, green water refers to coastal operations. Brown water is riverine. Uh, the book is an operational history. It's based on documents. Uh, the major documents would be the, the command operational reports submitted by units, the uh, NAV4V monthly summaries, material from the uh, NAV4V awards branch, correspondence coming out of NAV4V, um, message traffic coming, up, coming out of subcommands. So that's, that's how I, th that, was, that was one of my primary sources. The other primary source was oral history. I conducted literally hundreds of oral histories. I didn't use all the oral histories, uh, but I conducted many, many oral histories with veterans. And those became an important way to enliven the narrative, to, to enrich the narrative. Uh, what, I, what I had to do with oral histories uh, 
because memory isn't always good 40 to 50 years after an event, is every time I conducted an oral history, I had to go back into the archives and try to match up uh, events with actual documents. I wasn't, I, I, I refused to just take what a veteran, as much as I respected the veterans, I refused to take what they said uh, as fact until I could corroborate those facts. Uh, it provides deep context. It is critical history, meaning I point out where the Navy faulted, and I also point out the Navy's various successes. And finally, it honors the service and sacrifice of, uh, of Navy and Army veterans in Vietnam. Context. The, the, the Navy's experience in Vietnam didn't just grow out of, uh, out of a vacuum. It grew out of the experience of the advisory period. And the advisory period ran from 1950 to 1965, and it was a period where the Navy and all the services sent advisors to Vietnam to train the fledgling armed forces of the Republic of Vietnam. The Navy, uh, in the early 60s, had about 8,000 personnel. It was called the VNN, the Vietnam Navy. It had three components, but the, the components of the VNN don't exactly match the components of the, US, the USN in-country. They had a coastal force, which was a militia-type organization. It was spread out along the 1,200-mile coastline of Vietnam in, in small bases, and they fielded uh, junks, both motorized and sailing junks, and their major task was counter-infiltration. There was a river force which not only patrolled the rivers but engaged in amphibious assaults and performed the work that our naval support activities later perform, which is logistics. They, they moved supplies to Arvin units that were along rivers. Um, by 1965, there were 44 ships and over 200 other vessels and supported by U.S. Navy advisors. Now, Today, when, when the armed services sends advisors abroad, they get, a, they get a lot of training. They get language training, cultural training, uh, medical training. They get, they, get, they get tremendous training. Then, uh, some of the advisors were, were sent to Vietnam with only a few months, or in, in some cases, a few weeks of language training, uh, and very little cultural training. And they, these, these advisors were literally Parachute. They weren't literally parachuted, but they were sent in to very remote units, put on boats on their own, were, f were confronted with an entirely Vietnamese environment. No one could communicate. Uh, they had to eat. They, they, were, they did not bring MREs. They had to eat Vietnamese food, and in many cases, uh, your food was the chicken that was, that was slaughtered on the boat, and many of them got sick. Um, many of them fought alongside the VNN and, were, uh, and did some very heroic things. Uh, Dale Meyercord was one of the first uh, advisors killed. The Navy later named a frigate after him. Uh, but there were problems. Um, as I mentioned, the advisors didn't have the language training to, to do their job. The VNN suffered from a host of problems. Uh, money was a problem. They, had, they, didn't, they, ne they never had enough money to pay their sailors, and pay their sailors regularly, and pay their sailors well. Uh, so morale tended to be low. Uh, there were problems with maintenance. There were problems with training. The officer corps was highly politicized. and. Um, and there were very few experienced petty officers. And, and this is a sort of, this picture captures some of the problems of the VNN. You have a very young sailor with a World War II era Thompson submachine gun sitting on a sailing junk. And in the early 60s, the North Vietnamese were supplying most of their forces in the South by sea. And those ocean-going freighters were equipped with heavy machine guns and even, and even larger crew serve weapons. And this was the defense. Uh, now, of course, there were other ships, but, um, but the major 
sort of counter infiltration force was this junk force. The seizure of a freighter in Vung Ro Bay became, in 1965, became the catalyst for the U.S. Navy's intervention into Vietnam. And initially, uh, well, the freighter proved two things. It proved that seaborne infil sea, the sea was a way that the Viet Cong were infiltrating supplies into Vietnam. Also, it took the Vietnamese four days to to secure the vessel, that was too long. The vessel was initially spotted, not by the Vietnamese, but by a U.S. helicopter. And it, it, it was a catalyst that drove Westmoreland to, to get serious about uh, setting up a blockade of South Vietnam. And initially, that blockade was, was done by the 7th Fleet, TF-71. It was a, a a barrier force on the, on the 17th parallel. There were also eight patrol sectors along the coast. The initial rules of engagement were very strict. U.S. vessels could detect, but they couldn't seize. Uh, and the seizures, the seizures had to be done within the 12, mile, not, 12 nautical mile territorial seas of Vietnam and only by Vietnamese units. So, what, ha what the Navy did to improve the situation was they formed TF-115 in 1965. It was based on a barrier system, outer, middle, and, and inner. Uh, eventually, 5,000 personnel and 126 craft were involved. Uh, the interesting, there, are, there are a number of interesting things about this period. One was, in terms of command and control, the, there was a, a new command was stood up called ComNav for V before the Navy, naval assets in country were controlled by the chief naval advisor who was in 06, 1965, an admiral takes over, new command, new prestige, uh, more prestige for the Navy. Uh, the admiral that was sent over was Norvell Bub Ward. And interestingly enough, he was not a surface officer. He was a submariner. By, uh, and he uh, actually a Navy Cross recipient from World War II, but he had commanded a destroyer in the Korean War, and he and he 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 was much loved once he came on board uh, in Vietnam. He 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 visited all the all the advisors, every Vietnamese unit, and. Uh, he came away from that tour concluding that the, the Vietnamese were essentially not doing anything. But in defense of the Vietnamese, uh, once the U.S. Navy began taking over infiltration, the Vietnamese Navy could step back and start to do the things that they had been ignoring during the advisory period, such as training, maintenance, uh, developing an officer corps. And that put the, the Vietnam Navy in very good steed for, for, for its later years when the Navy left. The, v, the VNN performed very well uh, during the latter period of the war up, up until the very end. One other thing about market time. The Coast Guard was a highly valued partner in this uh, operation. Coast Guard cutters were, were deployed. Uh, this is a picture of the 1,200-mile coastline of Vietnam. With the, various, uh, the, with the various patrol sectors and, and the various barriers. You'll note that the outer barrier was, uh, that role was shared between air and surface. And maritime surveillance in Vietnam became a critical component. The, the SB2 and, the, and later the P3, they had a range of well over 4,000 miles. Their radars could look out over 200 miles. And once these aircraft were deployed, very few uh, steel hold freighters or, or, or metal junks were able to infiltrate the barrier without being initially detected by an aircraft. If they weren't detected by an aircraft, they'd be detected very easily by a powerful um, surface radar. The inner the middle barrier was the, the VNN Sea Force. The, uh, uh, yes, the VNN Sea Force. And the inner barrier consisted of PCF swift boats, 
and Coast Guard WPBs. And finally, in 1965, the Navy was able to, uh, the rules of engagement changed, which allowed US Navy ships to seize and engage infiltrators within the 12 mile limit. In terms of acquisition, the Navy uh, took an interesting approach to Vietnam. They acquired many boats right off the shelf and just modified them. They, there were only a few boats, there's the Alpha boat and the MRF, uh, for example, that were developed from scratch as, as rivering warfare boats. Uh, what the Navy did instead was, it, it, well, this is a good example, the PCF. This was a boat that, had, that was developed by, Stu or manufactured by Stuart Seacraft of Berwick, Louisiana, and it was designed to ferry oil workers from the coast to oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. It was high speed, it could go 28 knots, it had, um, and it only drew three and a half inches of water, and the Navy modified it. It put, um, it put a 50 caliber uh, gun tub uh, on, mounted on top of the deck house, and an 81 millimeter 50 caliber uh, machine gun aft. And um, this little, this little boat not only became an excellent interceptor, but that 81 millimeter uh, mortar could be used to, uh, to, to illuminate areas at night, and later on became very effective uh, with, uh, for naval gunfire support. Uh, the Coast Guard, uh, the Coast Guard equivalent of the PCF was the WPB. I don't have a picture of the WPB, but it was an, it was a um, 81 foot cutter. It was a bit slower than the PCF, but more seaworthy. So during the monsoon periods, the Coast Guard were able to step in and provide good coverage. The one of the weaknesses of the PCF, besides the fact that it was thin skinned, uh, was it wasn't very seaworthy in in 15 foot waves. And there were several instances, PCF-77 was hit by a rogue wave, it was flipped end over end, and three sailors were killed. Um, the Coast Guard WPB didn't, ha it, it was, you know, it was still a small boat, but it, it, had, it had better seaworthy uh, sea handling char characteristics. Why was market time so successful? Uh, it was impossible for, for steel hold junk or freighter to penetrate the blockade, there were aggressive junior officers in command, excellent coordination between units. Uh, junior officers and sailors were the key to the Navy's success. And in the book, I'm not able to go deeply into uh, provide deep anecdotes for this talk, but in the book, there are many anecdotes from the, uh, from the oral histories, including uh, one uh, about Charles Mosher, who was the Point Grey commander, uh, was involved in a trawler intercept. And this is co Commissaryman Second Class William Kepler. And what's interesting is he's, he's receiving a, a Purple Heart for his role in the battle, but he's a commissaryman. The Navy drew people from all sorts of odd ratings for for Vietnam, not just your traditional right arm ratings, your, your bosun's mates, your gunner's mates, but even commissary men. And many people from sort of esoteric ratings rose to the occasion and became some of the most valuable sailors uh, on, a, on a given boat, people like commissary men Kepler. Infiltration was occurring not just on the coast, but on the rivers. And it was decided in 1965, in late 1965, to establish a river patrol force to augment the efforts of TF-115. The river patrol force was designed to patrol the major waterways. Not every waterway in the Mekong Delta could be patrolled by 100 PBRs. That was simply impossible. What the PBRs could do is they could keep the major waterways open to river traffic. They could prevent, uh, they could search some suspicious craft, although they were 
thousands of sampans, water taxis, etc. And they could also try to prevent the Viet Cong from crossing from, in, in, in from major river crossings of these, you know, the four major rivers of the Mekong Delta. So, uh, and that's how uh, James Elliott Williams received his Medal of Honor. He stopped a major river crossing on 31 October. Uh, and Williams died b before I started work on this, on this book, but I interviewed most of his shipmates. I interviewed members of his family. I interviewed, um, I, I went to the awards branch, and I not only, have, not only got the, the Medal of Honor citation, which is online, but a very voluminous and thick file of backup interviews and backup materials that the, the awards branch did uh, for the research into his Medal of Honor. This is the Mekong Delta, and you can see those are the four major rivers, the Mita, Hamlong, Cochin, and Basak. And some of those rivers are you know, up to a mile wide in, in parts. One of the immediate challenges of TF-165 was, was basing. The, the Mekong Delta is mostly, uh, mostly consists of rice paddies. It's mostly underwater. So where do you put dry land bases? You don't want to displace locals because that just creates more enemies. So a lot of dredging had to be done. And the, one of the, the biggest efforts was Dong Tam, which was the, the base for the MRF. It was north of Mito. Actually, in Vietnamese, it's pronounced Mita, but all the veterans pronounce it as Mito. And one of the, the largest dredges in the world was brought in to build that base, Jamaica Bay. And it was actually, it was actually mined. And James Elliott Williams and his crew were instrumental in saving some of the crew of that, uh, of that dredge. It's one of the other things that Williams did. I don't just talk about his Medal of Honor. Uh, action, but some of the other things he did as well. A, a stopgap was riverine basing. Uh, the Navy deployed LSTs along those major rivers, usually in the widest parts of those rivers for force protection reasons. And you can see the, the PBRs are rafted uh, against the, that LST. The LSTs not only provided food, water, medical, fuel, maintenance. But in the Mekong Delta, you had to be able to dry out, or you, you would be subject to paddy foot and other tropical illnesses. So the sailors on these PBRs could, could, could spend the night. They, they liked to spend the night on their boats. But when they, were really, you know, when they really needed to dry out, they could go on board, have some good food, and um, and be healthier for their next mission. The PBR was another off-the-shelf piece of technology. It was, a, um, it was built from a 31-foot uniflight cabin cruiser. And I mean, they, just, they just modified it. They modified it in several ways. Obviously, the deck house is different. Uh, but they also replaced screws with jacuzzi water pumps powered by twin 216 horsepower diesel engines. And the great thing about, about water jets is the maneuverability. You can go up a small canal and then back out of the canal. You can hydroplane over a sandbar. You can turn on a dime. And many of the more expensive, if anyone is into boating, or they, these kinds of boats are, are available for commercial or for, for recreational use. And when you're going into a tight marina, you can use these, these, uh, the jet propulsion to, to maneuver. Um, it was, um, they were built for uh, $75,000 a piece, which in today's money is about 547000 And about 100 were deployed initially. Here's a picture of a PBR searching a sampan. Unfortunately, there were more of these wooden craft uh, than there were PBRs. Uh, it was very difficult to control all of the waterways. It's kind of analogous to, you know, in 
the police, the local police departments, not only controlling the interstates, but every road within the District of Columbia, it's, it's not possible. TF-116, therefore, had mixed results. It, it, it had a limited effect in halting supplies on the, water, on the waterways because there were just so many waterways. But what it did do is it succeeded in stopping a number of major river cro crossings. It also secured those major rivers. Uh, and there's a fifth river, which is the Long Tau, which runs up to Saigon. And not only were PBRs instrumental, but the, Navy's, the, the Navy deployed small minesweepers uh, that, were, that were also involved in keeping those waterways open for commerce. The Viet Cong was never able to starve Saigon, uh, and thanks in part to TF-116. The final task force deployed during the early years of Vietnam was the Mobile Riverine Force. And whereas PBRs and PCFs could go, you know, PBR could go 25 knots, PCF 28 knot, what the Navy, the Navy took a different approach to the MRF. The, the job was to haul troops to a combat zone, and the Navy had some experience with that in World War II with, with, and, and Korea with landing crafts. So they, they basically took World War II landing craft and converted them, LCMs, converted them a little bit, or up-armored them a bit for Vietnam service. Some were, became troop carriers, ATCs, or tango boats, and others were mic boats, which were monitors. They, that, was the, that, that provided mobile firepower. Uh, there was even a, a flame-throwing monitor called the Zippo monitor. The Mobile Riverine Force, the Army component was the 9th ID, and the Navy component was two river assault squadrons, each with 45 um, of these modified landing craft. One of the problems with the MRF was that these landing craft could only steam, under the best circumstances, seven knots. And when you take into consideration tides and, um, and currents, that number decreases significantly. So the Viet Cong often knew well ahead of time that the, the MRF was coming. Now fortunately, the armor protected the, the troops from, from small arms, but later, of course, the Viet Cong uh, employed uh, anti-tank rockets, uh, armor piercing. And I actually went to Mito and I interviewed one of the guys who uh, operated one of those uh, one of those rockets um, during the Tet Offensive, <coughs> and uh, they were un they were unfortunately quite effective, and and the result was uh, some significant loss, both on the Army and Navy side. Uh, MRF it it killed more Viet Cong than any other inshore unit. It also suffered the highest casualties. The most significant thing that the MRF did, along with TF-116, is that it saved the Delta. Uh, during the Tet Offensive, the Viet Cong seized most of the major towns, or uh, seized or surrounded, in most cases surrounded, uh, places like Ventre and Mital and Canto and Ven Long. And the helicopters were in extremely short supply, so the only way that Westmoreland was able to relieve some of these beleaguered posts was with the MRF. A lot of the Arvin, the Arvin also participated, but a lot of the Arvin had been, a, you know, the, the soldiers had, had been on leave for the Tet holiday. The command structure of the MRF was, was interesting. And this is a picture of uh, Admiral Saltzer, or captain at the time, uh, Saltzer. He's without the helmet and, and Bert David Colonel, U.S. Army, they were co-equals. So there, was no, there wasn't an overall commander of the MRF. When the, when the MRF was steaming on the rivers, uh, Salter was in command. As soon as the troops left the boats, then David took command. And if there were any disputes, they, those disputes could all, would go up the chain of command, up to ComNav 4B, and up to the core level or field force level in the Army. 
And if they still didn't get resolved, it, it, would, go, it would go all the way to Westmoreland. But fortunately, uh, David and, 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 um, and, and Salzer and, and all, the all, all the folks in the MRF generally got along with their Army counterparts. And, um, and, it worked, and it worked out. The book not only, I've talked a lot about operations today, but the book also emphasizes the humanity behind the hardware. Uh, and, I, and I bring in stories from oral histories to highlight the roles of people like uh, Padre Ra Raymond Johnson. Uh, he was the first chaplain since the Korean War to receive a silver star in battle. Uh, he received the Silver Star for uh, treating wounded uh, soldiers uh, on the battlefield with the MRF. And he's still, he's still alive. He lives, he lives out west. In conclusion, the book focuses on three major task forces, 115, 116, 117. Vietnam in-country war was a huge endeavor, over 174,000 sailors served in country, over 350 vessels. Uh, the U.S. Navy lost over 2,600 sailors. The 9th Infantry Division lost about the same number of soldiers. For those who are interested, um, the book is available through the government publishing office. It's also available online. And you don't have to take this, this down because I have cards with the URL where you can download it in PDF. And, and read it for free. And that concludes my discussion. Are there questions? They could have provided top cover for the boat. Do you uh, talk about that? I, I do. And, and I also talk m more extensively about HAL 3, which was a Navy light helicopter uh, unit that was stood up to support the TF 116 and 117. And they deployed those helicopters not only on dry land bases, but also on the LSTs. And even the Mike boats, uh, they actually created a medical boat that had a little, little deck that a helicopter could just rest on and, and pull a, a wounded sailor or a wounded sa soldier out of the medical boat and, and get that person to, to, uh, to, to a hospital. So. Later, the, the Navy also uh, deployed OV-10 Broncos um, to South Vietnam as well. So the, the air support was, it really was a joint effort. There, were <laughs> there was also Air Force support for uh, units operating in the Mekong Delta. So it depended on who was available at what time. And, uh, but the, the Navy's light helicopter unit also scouted. So when the MRF would launch a convoy, you'd have, you'd have helicopters out in front looking for ambush spots and looking for potential ambushes. So they, were not only, they not only provided gunfire support, dust off, but also scouting for the uh, MRF. Yes, sir. All right, did the Marines play a role at all in uh, MRF operations or anything more broadly? Early in the war, and I talk about it, there was a marine operation called Jack Stay. It was an, amphib it was an early amphibious operation before even the, the MRF was stood up. But then the, sort of the Marines, their focus became I Corps and the unit tasked with helping the Navy, or I think the Navy helped the Army or vice versa, was, was the 9th ID, 9th Infantry Division. So in the book, the 9th Infantry Division gets a lot, gets a lot more attention than the Marine Corps. Yes, sir? Did these junior officers go on to bigger and better things, or were these tours of duty considered sort of one-off, that it would quickly do that and then get back to uh, driving the cruisers and the destroyers and the carriers and the, and the ambulances? Uh, most, of the, most of the officers that I spoke with did not make flag. Most of them didn't make 06. Most of them did their tour in Vietnam and got out as, as lieutenants. Uh, but some did. Uh, at the time, it was considered, if, if you volunteered for Vietnam, you were definitely getting out of your career pipeline as a surface officer. And it was def definitely considered detrimental to your professional health. <laughs> but 
uh, those who, who did it volunteered because, hey, this is an opportunity you're straight out of uh, ROTC, NROTC, or straight out of the academy. Uh, you get to command a boat, uh, or in some cases, a, a small unit, um, a river division. And that's not something you would, you would get. You'd be a division, of, a division officer on a ship. That's, that's a whole different experience. But the Navy saw that, often saw that division officer assignments more important than doing this. Yes, sir. You talk about development. You have a, an inner barrier, a middle barrier, and an outer barrier. Were there any other schemes or systems uh, examined uh, with regard to coastal and marine control? I beg your pardon? I so you talk about a, an inner barrier, a middle barrier, <coughs> and an outer barrier. Were there any other schemes or systems examined with regard to coastal and, and marine control? Later in the war, Zumwalt. Admiral Zumwalt comes up with a, 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 the idea of a blocking barrier because it, at the by that point, 1969, it's determined that, hey, mark time's very successful. They're not, they're not moving stuff by sea. How are they getting stuff? They're getting it through, si through, through Cambodia. And so he, he decides to push Riverine and even, he even pulls PCFs from TF-115, pushes them up the river forms blocking belts uh, in, in, in an attempt to prevent infiltration from Cambodia. So, but, it, but not, until, not until that time. And the, and the market time barrier still existed. It wasn't as if we just did away with market time once, uh, once sea lords occurred. <coughs> well, yes. Did that lead to the increased use of Agent Orange then? Uh, Zumwalt talks about it in, in his book. If, if for these, for these boats going along the shore, there isn't vegetation. It's a lot safer. So yeah, they're, they're the Agent Orange became a safety measure uh, for, you know, f for sailors. It saved lives then. It killed people downstream. It's uh, one of the big tragedies of the war. Yes, sir. Uh, during the French's time there, did they have some kind of equivalent force that was doing stuff like this, or did they just stayed off the water? The, the who? When the French were there before. The oh, uh, the French uh, inaugurated this whole concept of amphibious riverine assault. They had uh, something called a dinoso, which was the, the, the first riverine assault unit. They used it not only in the Mekong Delta, but also in the Red River Delta during the first Indo-Chinese War. And the VNN basically grew out of that experience, the, f the French experience, and, and essentially copied what the, what the French had done during that first Indochina China War, 1950 to 54. Yes, sir. Uh, there seems to be a focus on the Mekong Delta, but did you also cover uh, intercoastal riverine actions up near the DMZ? Uh, I, I I do, um, especially, especially during the Tet Offensive, uh, TF Task Force Clearwater. Uh, there was a there was a task force of of uh, riverine craft that were sent up to I Corps to assist the Marines in keeping those rivers, um, uh, controlling those rivers, and also uh, uh, using those rivers to bring supplies. In fact, uh, Caisson. Uh, was supplied up to the last, I believe, 50 miles by river, and then, and then there was the air bridge. So uh, I do talk about that, and I also talk about the Kamau Peninsula, and uh, there were some, some significant trawler actions down there. I talk about that. That became more significant, that area under Zumwalt. That's, of course, where sea float was and solid anchor. That's a, I, I hope someone will, will, will jump at the idea of, of writing a book about sea lords because it, 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 deserves, it deserves a book length treatment. There is actually somebody working on Alan uh, over at U.S. Coast Guard headquarters. Oh, okay. Yeah, in the historian's office. Um, that's, that's under development as we speak. Okay, great. Any other questions? <coughs>
come across any like strategic uh, successes that employment capability had in that time period you were analyzing? Well, the blockade was was a strategic success, and the MRF was strategically successful during the Tet Offensive, provided the capa Westmoreland with the capacity to relieve <coughs> these towns that were either under attack or had been seized by the Viet Cong. The only area where the Navy didn't do as well is, is in trying to secure all the rivers. It simply didn't have the assets. Because it, it, the Mekong Delta is not just four rivers, it's interlaced with, with canals. And some of these canals, if you've been to Ben Trey, the canal, you know, it looks like the Anacostia River. It's a, it's a very, very wide body of water. And there was simply no way that 100 PBRs could secure that amount of, of real estate. But with the blockade, the blockade was, was, was quite successful. Nothing that was made of steel could get through the blockade. Now, wooden junks, yes. There were many smaller wooden junks. But it's hard, it's hard to supply your forces with the, the, the number of wooden craft compared to a steel hulled freighter, many multiples. So. But of course, the Viet Cong, they, they employed countermeasures, as I mentioned. They, the the armor-piercing the armor -piercing rockets were particularly devastating. Their use of mines was devastating. They, they mined two of our sea bases, uh, Westchester County and, a, and a, a barracks ship, YRBM-16, resulting in, in, in significant loss of life, despite the fact that nets were, were in place around these boats and sailors threw concussion grenades off of the, uh, the bow and the stern at regular intervals during the course of every night, making sleep difficult. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, in the back. Sir, when, the, um, when these units were getting in heavy combat operations, did they call for fires from the deep water Navy, from the blue water Navy, and was that ever supported for these, these units? Yeah. Uh, generally not, although market time had larger units. Uh, it had larger cutters. Later, later on in the war, there were DERs uh, that were fairly, uh, that, that had five inch guns. But as far as, as larger caliber stuff, cruisers, battleship, that sort of thing, no. Uh, the, the PCFs and the WPBs, on the other hand, were often requested by Marines, by Marine Anglico officers to provide gunfire support with that tiny 81 millimeter mortar because it was highly accurate, it was safe, and it was speedy. They could get, they could get to where the Marines were, get in there, use a small 81 millimeter mortar shell and, and do the job. I'm standing up to see if there's a final question before I ask one more question, just in case. Please, sir. Yes. Uh, we did a lot of work over there of a humanitarian nature as well. Uh, from a medical perspective, uh, some of the crews went ashore and helped uh, with rebuilding schools, it's painting, uh, things of that nature. Do you address the I humanitarian I piece? Uh, I, I do. I look. I look at some of the MedCap missions. I look at some of uh, the, the cleft lip palate. Uh, initiative. A lot of humanitarian operations were done by the Seabees. That I, in fact, the majority. So I, I don't cover that aspect. But when it involved riverine units, uh, I did. Yes. And there should be, it should be in the index. My question was going to be about the relationship with the Vietnamese Navy and what respect or distrust the U.S. Navy people that you talked to evinced about it and what they demonstrated and the relationship with that they might have had with the Vietnamese Navy. Well, it was a civil I'll, war. I'll turn that around. I, I, have, I developed a very good relationship with Captain Do Kiem, who became the, the chief of staff of, to the Viet, VNN CNO late in the war. He was involved in moving the VNN to the Philippines at the end of the war. And he, he basically said there were some naval officers who were overwhelmed. They, they were overwhelmed by the language barrier, by the food, the, the hot weather, everything, and kind of withdrew. Uh, 
And then there were other officers uh, like uh, Captain Peter Schwartz, mm -hmm. for example, who's still at CNA, uh, who engaged with these officers. They, they came in with limited language experience, but they were willing to learn. They were sometimes willing to meet halfway by speaking French. That became a useful way of communicating. And, um, and some very, very strong bonds were formed. In fact, there are a variety of naval officers who actually took in their counterparts into their houses after the war. When these, when these guys were in, in the Philippines as refugees, they said, hey, come over, bring your family, stay in my, you know, stay in my little house in, DC, in the DC suburbs, live here for as long as you need to to get your feet on the ground. So um, uh, there's, there's it's, it's a mixed story. Well, with that, a round of applause, please, for John Shirley. Thank you.